Hello gardeners and landscapers everywhere. We're so happy that you've tuned in because we're going to talk about all things in the garden and in the landscape, so stick with us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department and we are on the Urbana Champagne, Champagne campus. So I'll talk about cut flowers and perennials, but there are three super intelligent, and engaging people next to me here, and we're gonna find out about them and their expertise so people can be directing their questions in the right way. Well, first, I'm going to send it on over to you, Kay Carnes. Okay, hi, I'm Kay Carnes. I'm Champaign County Master Gardener, and my areas of expertise are um, herbs, vegetables, especially heirloom vegetables, and seed saving. Great. And uh, speaking of vegetables, I brought an asparagus spear tonight because I want to talk a little bit about growing asparagus. Asparagus is getting ripe now and popping up like crazy. I've been picking mine for about a week and a half. Um, and if you've not ever had fresh asparagus out of the garden, you are really missing something. Um, it, it does take a little work to establish um, a bed but once you get it established, um, it's very low maintenance and easy to take care of. So you want to get, um, to start your bed, you want to get a one-year-old crowns and you need to dig a trench, and this is the hard part, you dig a trench that's about six to eight inches deep and about eight to 10 inches wide. Um, and then you take, you lay your crowns out and you want to space them about every 12 inches. You flatten out the uh, roots and then cover them partially with the dirt that you've dug out and you gradually, as the plant gets larger, you gradually backfill that in until the dirt's all in there. Um, the first year you really don't want to pick any because uh, you want to let it get established. The second year you can pick for about a week, uh, the third year for two or three weeks and then after the fourth year on you can pick as much as you, you want. Uh, at the end of the season, you want to leave some of the fronds uh, growing in the garden so they get energy to the roots for the following year. So I was going to say you can pick until all you want or until you just can't stand the, the <laughs> sight of an asparagus again. Cause they <laughs> I really, never get to that point. Well, <laughs> I think there was a point a couple years ago, but oh, it's such a good And vegetable. there's so much you can do with it in the kitchen that just... It was showing up in every meal, I think, there at the end uh, a couple years ago. Thank you, Kay. That was a good discussion on asparagus. Now you're all going to want to do it. All right, now let's go to Kelly Alsup in the middle. Thank you, Diane. Hi, my name is Kelly Alsup, and I am a horticulture educator for Extension. Uh, I'm based out of Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. I would say definitely my expertise is um, our indoor plants, house plants, tropicals. Um, and, but today I'm excited to talk about pollinator plants because I'm really into pollinator gardening right now. And I wanted to show you one of my new favorite native plants. And so I'm gonna show you, it is called Golden Alexander. And it uh, will get about two feet tall. It's native to Illinois. It has these really pretty yellow uh, umbel shaped flowers that bloom in late spring for about a month. And the bees and flies and wasps and but little butterflies love this plant. But what I really love about it is that the larva of black swallowtail um, will eat the foliage of this plant. And if you know a little bit about the larva of black swallowtail, you may, if you find a caterpillar on your dill or your parsley this summer, that would be a larva of black swallowtail. So you just leave those guys alone, let them have it, because really do we need all that parsley and dill? They're really good growers. And so this is just another larval source, plus the bees love it. So I'm really excited about this plant. <laughs> it's quite pretty. Yes, it is. Very nice. Well, good. Thank you, Kelly, Thank very you. much. All right, and now to my left is Dr. Phil Nixon. Take it away, Phil. Hi, I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois, which means I do bugs. 
And I want to talk about this time of the year in, in the middle to later, in middle part of spring to early to mid spring. So when we need to start thinking about controlling our emerald ash borer. And if you have emerald ash borer that has been found within 15 miles of where you live, the time to treat for emerald ash borer is when the leaflets are at least three quarters uh, expanded. Uh, leaflets of emerald ash borer will get uh, will get probably about uh, three or four inches long, probably about four. And so once they get about as long as your index finger, it's a good time to treat. The reason we wait that long is because some honeybees in some years will collect the pollen, even though it's a wind pollinated tree, they will connect, collect the pollen and you do not want the systemic insecticide in that pollen. So once the leaves are at least three quarters uh, expanded, then they will, then they will go, then, then the pollen has gone far enough that there's not a problem with that. And whether you have a tree injected or you want to do a soil drench or something of that nature, we normally look at about three quarters leaf expansion. The beetle itself will come out of D-shaped holes that are about an eighth, an inch, eighth of an inch across, and they will come out, out from in the southern part of our viewing area from approximately the uh, third week or so of May to about the third week or so of June in the northern part of our viewing area. And so they come out of these out of these small holes like this. And the beetle itself is about a half an inch long and just really a nice emerald shiny green color. Uh, so uh, if you have ash trees and if you have emerald ash borer nearby, realize that the time for treatment is coming up, but wait until those leaves are free quarter expanded before you treat. I did not know that about the three-quarter expanded. That's a good mm -hmm. addition to our, unfortunately, intense knowledge about emerald ash borer. So thank you, I'm glad to know that. Well, let's go to our Did You Know video next. House plants like the asparagus fern are considered toxic to cats. True ferns are less dangerous, but that doesn't mean you should let your cat nibble them. If your cat consumes part of a fern, call your vet immediately. Okay, we need a few more callers. We do have a few on the line, but we'd love to hear from some of you. Let's go to line two, and Ann has a question about some catalog plants. Hi, Ann. Hi, Diane. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I order a lot of plants from catalog. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, they don't always pay attention to our weather. Yes. <laughs> What's the best thing I should do about those plants when I get them way too early? Great Put question. Put them in la larger pots, just leave them alone. Now, um, is it things that you get there in soil? You're not getting bare root trees or things like that? Right, okay. right. Okay. I'm looking at Kelly or Kay, either one, but who would like to start? Um, I usually repot them when I get them. And uh, I don't know, are these indoor plants or plants that you're gonna put outside? Oh, definitely outside. Okay. It was just too wet or cold. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd, I'd repot them for a while and let them get used to your weather conditions. Uh, maybe, you know, on nice days, put them outside and let them get some sunshine and uh, adapt to the um, to the light and and then um, you know when their individual um, conditions are met if it's a hot weather plant you want to wait till after frost before you put it out and um, just kind of nurture them a little bit and don't overwater them that's the worst thing you can do mm -hmm. um, but, um, and then go ahead and plant them and if you happen to get some uh, <coughs> bare root uh, small trees or shrubs, uh, things that are a couple, three feet tall or less. Uh, you can do what they call healing them in, mm -hmm. which involves digging a trench if you've got a number of them and you cover up the roots. You don't have to have them straight up and down. They can be at a slant or whatever and leave them that way until you get ready to, to plant them. Try to get them planted though before the leaves come out on the trees. I know that sometimes I actually wait a little bit, but to order, but then you don't always get the plants. If you mm -hmm. don't order them early, they run out, so, uh, you know, maybe have not enough uh, supply. 
So yeah, it is a little bit tricky. Diane, in the greenhouse, if we want to hold a plant, right. we would put it in a cooler uh, for a little bit longer and then pull it out and force it um, into you know foliage before you know when we needed to market it. But I just want to make sure that she doesn't pot them up too big. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, if it's a three inch pot, maybe put it in a six inch pot um, so you're not drowning out the roots. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you're, it's going to be actively growing, it does need some light. Well, that was a great question about how to stall catalog plants. So you may want to also look for some of those plants locally in your local mm -hmm. garden centers. I always like to plug local garden centers. I like the feel and touch and seeing them. Okay, let's go to Jean's question on line three about a pine. Hi, Jean. Yes, uh, my question was more along the lines of uh, pine needles, are they good mulch or are they not? Oh, pine needles, okay. Mulching with pine needles. Well, Who wants to weigh in? You have to be careful because they're fairly acidic. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to watch your, your soil pH levels if you're mulching with pine needles. Um, I don't know if anybody else has got... You could mix them yeah, in with the other if you... But they do form a nice mat, so they mm -hmm. stay put once they're in place. But I do some mixing in, but normally I just leave it under my pine tree. Yeah. I really like that look under my pines, but, but if you have too much... For use some it, plants like azaleas and mm -hmm. rhododendrons sure. and, like and hydrangeas, sure. that might at be a good addition of acidity. That's true. Okay, well, good question about pine needle mulch. Let's go to Tom's question on line five, and it's about ladybugs. Hi, Tom. Hi, Diane. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. This year was uh, a little bit worse than last year, but this year on my cherry trees, I've got the red ladybugs with the red shells, and I've got some with the bright yellow shells. <clears throat> Which one is? I heard one is the one that kind of bites you a little bit and, and, and eats everything up. But then along with them, I've got these weird-looking ants that oh about three-eighths of an inch long, but they got bright red bodies, and they're just they're flying everywhere. How do I control this mess? Oh, I'm so glad you're here, <laughs> Phil. He doesn't think anything is a mess about this. So, no, you want to talk about the ladybugs? <laughs> well, um, yeah, the the ladybugs. Both of them are actually really good for the garden. They're beneficial insects. They're going to be eating other bad insects. The yellow one is the Asian lady beetle that was released for soybean aphids. And it's the one that does come into your home and smells bad, but it's still a very beneficial insect. As far as the red ants. I'll cover that one. Okay, I was oh, thinking good. it was. <laughs> That's I, divide I'm and conquer. What, aphids? Uh, actually, probably what he's seeing are winged ants and uh, three eighths of an inch long uh, are probably probably carpenter ants, I would guess. They could be, could be, uh, uh, big yellow ant as well. It's hard to say uh, what some people call call red, but if they've got a if they've got a blackish thorax or a front part of a body and then the back part of the abdomen is reddish, they're probably carpenter ants. These are carpenter ants that that will not come into your house, will not damage your house. Mm -hmm. The only ones that do is the black carpenter ant, which is all black, and so this is one that would get into uh, a rotting. Uh, trunk, uh, uh, stump, something of that nature, uh, a dead limb on a tree, something, of that, uh, something like that. And actually that helps break down that by them tunneling into it. So they're really not a uh, thing to be concerned about. And winged ants are normally going to be out for only just a few days and then they will dissipate because their main thing is to find somebody of the opposite sex, start a new colony. And so just bear with it. And if you get a nice day, you'll probably see the barn swallows chowing down on them as they fly away. Mm -hmm. And if you have any dragonflies around, the same. So just let nature take its course. These are not things that are going to cause any real problem. If they get into your tree, it's one that was, was essentially dead and rotting anyway, so don't worry a whole lot about it. So he can completely relax. Absolutely. <laughs> take it easy. Uh, no even the multicolored Asian lady beetle, which does come into your house and, 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 and can bite, uh, is uh, since it showed up in, in this in this 
in Illinois and, and in the Midwest. Uh, essentially, we don't have much in the way of scale and aphid problems anymore at all because they take care of them all. Mm -hmm. So the idea that these are all bad guys, totally away from the, from the truth, and Kelly's right on that these are beneficial insects, even the ones you don't think you like, they are helpful. They're a little annoying in the house in the mm -hmm. winter. Absolutely. But once they're outside, let them frolic and play yep. and eat <laughs> away. Inside, vacuum them oh. up, outside, enjoy them. Yes, there we go. Okay, very well done. Well, now we have a question about a yucca, and we're going to go to uh, Don on line four. Hi, Don. Hello. Enjoy your program very much. Watch Thank it you. Thank uh, you. Do you ever need to cut back yuccas in the late fall or cut off their stems or transplant them because there are too many of them? Okay, so tra go for it, Phil. Transplanting or <laughs> yeah, she's like, taking uh, care of yuccas. One thing about it, transplanting yuccas are almost impossible because you think you've driven, you've dug halfway to China and you won't get it all. It will come back up where you dug. I have dug as much as three and four feet deep and still had the plant come back. Uh, generally, you don't need to cut it off. If you want to in the spring, you probably can, but generally just, just let them do their thing. But getting rid of a yucca or moving it, in my experience, has been almost an impossible task. Put them where you want them, and if you get too many in one area, try to try to get rid of it, kill it out if you want, but chances are you're not gonna be successful. Does that sound good? All right. It happens, <laughs> it definitely happens. He can trim uh, back some of the older growth that doesn't look so great in the fall, but it's gonna be hard to take care of getting rid of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. And let's go to Dan's questions about a rose on line six. Hi there, Dan. Thank you for taking my call. You are welcome. Uh, I got a couple of knockout roses on the east side of the house and a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the plants uh, where they both bloomed with new uh, leaves. But one of the plants has uh, uh, leaves uh, kind of at the top that uh, have kind of turned brown and curled under like uh, something either has been eating on them or kind of a disease is starting. I wonder what that was. I would suspect that at this time of year, we have had in this spring a couple of nights when it got down to in the 20s, and very likely those that new growth that was at the top, even in the bud stage, got nipped by that frost, and what you're seeing is dieback associated with frost. Now. Uh, Roses will have a, have a pest called rose midge that will cause new buds to blast both flower buds and leaf buds and they will turn brown. But normally it's not the leaves around it. So I think your most apt, my, my suggestion would be that it's most likely to be uh, cold damage unless somebody's got a better idea here. If it continues to exhibit those kinds of symptoms, one of the things that I've been seeing in my area is botrytis on the roses and uh, it can just, especially in damp weather, it can just really make them look really bad. And if it continues and it doesn't grow out of it, then that could be uh, a, a candidate to send off to the plant clinic. Okay. And they would be able to tell you what it is. And because botrytis needs damp situations, anything you can do to increase the wind movement in that area will, will greatly reduce the problem. In other words, fitting out uh, hedges that might mm -hmm. be blocking the wind from it, maybe even move a rose plant to a more exposed location. One of the worst things you can do with a rose is put it where it's protected from a wind because it's more susceptible to black spot and some other diseases like botrytis. Okay. All right. Well, we have our next question on line two is Linda, and she's interested in the pollinator, I believe, Kelly. So, Linda, what is your question exactly? Line two. At the very beginning of the show, it was a pollinator plant, and it was named Golden, and I didn't get the full name. It is Golden Alexander. Alexander's. And Golden Alexander's, excuse me, sorry. And uh, it blooms in the late spring, this beautiful yellow bloom, and it is a, a larval source for black swallowtail, and it's native to Illinois. So go anywhere that you can find Illinois native plants, and you'll be able to find this plant. Okay. For sale. 
for sale. Yeah. Yeah. Don't course, dig up your own. Yeah, Hopefully, don't, unless you own the property, <laughs> yeah. don't dig it up and move it. Do you want to show your other plant, Kelly, while you're I at do. It? I have another plant. Um, uh, it's not native, but it is uh, an annual that's very prolific bloomer, and the uh, butterflies and the bees and the hummingbirds just absolutely love black and blue salvia, and it is so easy to grow to uh, you can you know plant it and almost forget about it but you know a little bit of water and fertilizer help keep it floriferous love that the way you work that in there <laughs> but, one of my favorite um, words but yeah i just love salvia i think it's easy to grow and the 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 the, the pollinators just absolutely love this plant well we have that pollinary follow-up question, but now we have an asparagus question or two, and I want to go to Jean's question on three about asparagus bugs. Hi there, Jean. Hi. I have a question for Phil. Okay, great. Go to pick asparagus. There are some black insects or black bugs, on, mostly on the tip. I want to know if I need to do anything about that. Uh, about all you can do is just pick them off because by the time they're on the spears, the spears grow fast enough that any insecticide you would use, organic or not, you would not you would end up coming bumping up against the pre-harvest interval. In other words, you'd have to wait longer than you really want to do for that to to uh, to pick it. Chances are, what you're seeing are aphids. They will get there are some black aphids that will get on asparagus later when you and and you can also get some little checkered. Uh, mm -hmm. bluish uh, and white checkered and, and red beetles. These are asparagus beetles that will feed on the spears. Later their larvae are black, but I've never seen the larvae on the spears. They show up later on the fronds and they get up to about a quarter of an inch long. So my guess is you're seeing aphids. If you wanted to spray uh, an insecticidal soap on it, that has a very short waiting period. Obey the label, it should be about a day. Uh, but uh, otherwise, what I would do is just pick them, wash them out, wash them off under the sink, and eat the part the bugs left you. It's good and fine. I have used your soapy water technique on the little beetles on the fronds. Okay. It doesn't always work, and then they drop into who knows where. But, yeah. but instead of insecticidal soap, which I didn't have on hand, I used the soapy water, yeah, like with the Japanese beetle trick. And the problem is if you put the soapy water on the plant, you can cause damage to the plant. You're yeah, talking about holding it underneath no, and make you hold them it underneath drop into it. Yes. And you just kind of tap. That's your Japanese beetle but technique. But you can spray the plant itself with insecticidal soap. It's been formulated to reduce damage to the plant itself. Okay. Yeah, you know what I would do with those aphids? Just a hard water spray. Just spray mm -hmm. them off the plant. Mm -hmm. Break their little mouth parts off. Which sometimes when we get spring rains, that takes yep. care of it uh, without doing too much. Well, I just can't resist going to the, the next asparagus question, so we're going to go to line four, and Oris, you have an asparagus question as well. Oh, line five, excuse me, line five. Do you have an asparagus question for us? Yes. My asparagus patch is doing very poorly. I'm, my question is, how, what can I do to renovate it? I put a little triple 12 on it early in the spring, but it's not doing very well, what, what can I do to renovate it? Another question is, I'd like to know the name of a real low growing cover plant for in around the hosta bed to keep down the weeds. Thank you. Okay, so let's do the renovating. I have a couple ideas, but if you have well, one as well. To begin with, how old is your patch? Oh, it's eight or 10 years old. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. Have, have, one thing you want to do is kind of side dress it with compost or for some kind of little fertilizer to help keep the plants um, healthy. So you might try that. Um, yeah, you use 12-12-12 fertilizer. Yeah, I just use compost, a, yeah. um, a good, you know, quality compost. And I've used really well, well rotted it. manure. Hmm? And I've it, used well rotted yeah, manure, but and more works. like in January. Yeah, yeah. Um, I put it on for late winter, and uh, so that's exactly that's uh -huh. when I do it too. Um, renovating, <laughs> it's really just <laughs> fertilizing it yeah. and getting, and yeah. they are heavy, heavy feeders. And it, you know, you might mulching. not overpick it this year. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said earlier, let some of those fronds grow because that gives energy to the root system, um, and that really helps uh, the plants. 
they always say a, a pencil or a pen thickness to pick them and wider. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with you letting maybe a few more stay on the, the, in the plant's area itself. So eight to ten is not too is not very old. That's a young yeah that is that's a young bed. I yeah. think it's fertilizer and maybe not overpicking mm -hmm. and mulching. Mm -hmm. Yes, mulching and, and mulching it heavy. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, ground cover. With, and oh, the ground cover. I'm not sure we're going to have time for the ground cover. If you have a quick one, yell it out, and then I'm going to end the show. Uh, gallium. Okay, sweet Rose, woodruff. Sweet woodruff would be great that. for wet shade. Pachysandra that's for wet shade. Okay. Dry shade. Epimedium. Oh, she's got them all. Well, that's three right there. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. We are glad that you've joined us and we love talking about plants and bugs. So I hope that you have a great week gardening. See you next time. Bye-bye.